All right. Um, so thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Paul. Uh, Paul is a professor in the Department of Biology here at Brandeis University. Um, his research focuses on neuroscience, specifically using computational and mathematical tools in dynamical systems with data from brains and neural circuits to understand how neurons um, communicate with each other. So today he will share some of the related work about information processing in networks with multiple quasi-stable attractor states. Okay, hi. So I'm just going to share my screen um, and hopefully the presentation will get going. <clears throat> okay, so you can all see that, I hope. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay, so hi, everyone. So I'm, I'm just going to begin with a little image for you to see the idea of what I mean by quasi-stable attractor state. Um, and there, there are different terms for it. For it. Um, in, in the sense that I'm talking about, um, you probably mostly know about relaxation oscillators. You can even think of them as one where there's two different states that you might switch between. Um, oh, interesting. I can't. Oh, okay. okay. My usual way for moving through a si slide is moved. So I'll, I'll just um, I'll just begin with this image, which you've probably all seen the NECA cube. And if you just stare in the middle for a while, um, what you may know is that at some point of time, this, actually, do you see my cursor? Yes. Okay, this face might be at the front and it's kind of like a left downward looking, but if you just stare in the middle, after a while, you might see a switch to this top face um, becoming, so it's more like an upward rightward looking cube. So, so this is, you know, well known, you know, that it has two different orientations and um, it's an example of a bistable percept. And the quasi-stability is the fact that um, there's a certain time where after you've been seeing one percept, it might just it might just switch to the other one. And there are adaptive processes in the brain that underlie that. And th this is kind of what I mean, that there might be some relatively stable state of activity that might persist for a while, and then it can switch to another one. And the kind of conceptual way we would look at this is that when we have these different percepts, the activity, which here we mean the rate of spiking of different neurons is changing. So there are some neurons that are more active, oh, I say clockwise and counterclockwise from a different one, but you can think of like the left face versus the right face being at the front for these different percepts. And the fact that we only see one percept at a time, um, you know, similarly to we can often only do like one motor pattern at a time, there's got to be some sort of cross inhibitions so that when one, one is active, it's suppressing the other. And what I'm, we're calling here self-excitation is meaning that the neurons that are, you know, corresponding or highly active for one percept, they are actually giving each other enough excitation to maintain it for some period of time. Because otherwise with neurons, if you don't give them input, they just become silent or quiescent after a little bit of time. Um, so this is some background as I believe not everyone has you know, done much neuroscience. Um, so the, gen the general features in our models, so, so I should say we're trying to you know, get to models that are somewhat realistic that incorporate essentials of the biology in reproducing a variety of phenomena. And what, you know, some key aspects of neurons is one that they're tradition directional, I mean, in general, and the ones in the cortex we're, we're going to be talking about. So they get inputs, which are basically coming from what we're calling spikes from other neurons. Those spikes um, produce a current in the postsynaptic cell, um, essentially because they're opening channels, which um, it's kind of like little batteries. Um, in a lot of our simulations, when we add noise, depending on the type, we might in, um, include essentially inputs from hundreds or thousands of other cells, which are really not specifically being simulated in the task. And we might treat that as a Poisson spike train. Um, and they'll, they'll give currents, which are basically like fluctuating over time. And then um, the currents, the neuron is really in some ways like a big capacitor, but it has leaks. So as you put current into a capacitor, there's a membrane potential, there's a charge goes across the membrane. And um, 
sorry, the charge creates the potential difference across the membrane. If the charge doesn't leak away quickly enough, enough charge is stored, the voltage will increase. And neurons have this kind of point of no, well, roughly a point of no return, but there are positive feedback processes that at some point will cause a kind of runaway excitation and you get a spike then this spike is gonna then produce inputs to the other cells. So if we actually like look through the equations of this, you got the presynaptic spike times. This S is a kind of synaptic gating variable. You can think of it as the fraction of channels that are open, the fraction of the maximum it can reach. Okay, which, so you get this little impulse each time that there's a spike, at time Tj from the presynaptic spikes. But when there's no spikes, there's some time constant for decay. This time constant becomes pretty important as to you know, how long information will persist in a circuit and so on. Um, then the, the net current to a, a postsynaptic cell depends on all the different inputs. And we kind of group them into two general categories. There are those that are excitatory that essentially give positive current. And this is based on the ions that flow. So this kind of, this is called a reversal potential, um, which you can see that when the input is large, this is putting the voltage of the postsynaptic cell towards this potential, Vx, whereas the, the other inhibitory inputs, there's basically a lower voltage where their reversal is input. So if this conductance is hard, it's pushing this voltage towards that reversal potential. Um, so you get positive and negative currents that are coming from the inputs. Um, and then the voltage is basically, it's integrating um, in the sense that if you have more input, then the voltage is gonna go up, okay? But in the absence of input, it might decay. And if we ignore this term for now, it will decay to a low level called the leak. Um, this term is in these models is basically, you know, it gives a runaway because this is a positive and there's a positive, positive sign in front of this V and there's an exponential rise. So this is what is a spiking mechanism in this. And this will go to infinity in, you know, really short time. Um, so you can set a high threshold. And when you say it reaches that threshold, you say there's a spike from this particular cell and then it's reset. Um, I think there's a question, I'm not sure, um, but um, I, I see one, a warning or something. So then you get the spikes of a cell. And then, then the key in all these systems is gonna be how the spikes from this cell, what other cells they interact with. Um, so you get the connectivity, which is a matrix, here, this WJI really contains a lot of the key um, aspects of how the network is going to behave. And, and this is partly, hence, has been a drive in the last decade or so, you know, to get connectomes, you know, how neurons are connected together. But as you will know from, you know, dynamical systems, it's not just whether there's a connection, but you could gradually adjust strengths in some of these um, parameters, and you can get very different dynamical behavior even with very small changes in these connections. And we'll look at some of that in this talk. Okay. Um, I see there's a second, I don't know if these are questions in the chat. Oh, please, sorry. Okay, it was someone saying to raise hands, sorry. Okay. So um, what we do in a lot of our models is we, we group cells into cells that are generally similarly responsive. Um, and the E stands for excitatory, okay, the I inhibitory. And we'll group them into these pools, which are really, you know, you can think of as a collection of similarly behaving cells. And then when you have many such pools, you could get some behavior. So the sort of bistability that I showed just now, where you have just two different um, kind of active states, you could um, generate simply by having, here we have the red pool and the green pool, and if they're getting equal input and there's noise, then there's a sort of symmetry breaking as to which of these is active. But then when one of them is active, um, it's this little circle is showing that it's in net um, suppressing the other. So if you have some neuron spiking, they're suppressing those. Then there are different effects that can cause you to switch from these cells spiking to those cells spiking. Or you can just have noise in your circuit, which will cause these noise flips. So you know, there's quite an extensive literature now on evidence in cortical, cortical activity for this. I'll just show you some examples and just one example of a kind of circuit we show that shows the general features. Um, of course, what, one thing that's, you know, 
I guess I've been criticized for um, and is a reasonable question. Is it reasonable to think of grouping these neurons into pools? And in particular, you can also think that some of the neurons in this pool might also be in that pool. And then if you're actually sharing neurons in kind of two pools, then that, that might act similarly to an excitation between them. So that when one pool is active, it is actually producing some fraction of activity in the other pool. So the, you know, so, so this is kind of distinguishing groups just for um, schematic purposes, but um, part one of the things we're looking at is, you know, how, how well the behaviors that you see when you separate neurons into these pools, how will, well that, you know, still applies or continues when we just treat the neurons a lot more individually, um, but maybe have some clustering or different extents of clustering. Okay, so, so I've got this unfortunate thing that my Zoom controls are, I always have to be over some of my screen. And I know smart people design slides now, so they have a space for these bars. Um, so I, I'm not gonna go into all of this, but some of you might know of hidden Markov modeling. And you can think of this as a, a type of analysis, data analysis that will extract um, distinct states in neural activity. And here you can see a distinct state where, for example, in this state, neuron number four is firing, as is neuron number one. Um, and that's following a state where here neuron number three is firing, but neurons four and one are silent. Um, when, when we analyze um, activity that, this way, and this is from um, Don Katz's lab looking at taste cortex, you see pretty rapid transitions between these states. And you could give identical inputs and on a different trial, okay, I always use an arrow to switch, on a different trial, you might see these transitions happening at different times. I should say the solid lines are saying, you know, that the output of the hidden Markov tells you the probability of being in a particular state at each point in time. It also optimizes what it thinks the state could be as to which, and a state is defined by a firing rate essentially for each neuron. And the neurons are firing probabilistically. So it's like a probability per unit time of a spike from a given cell. And at some point that will, probability will change. So here, you know, here there's a little period you see, this is quite a broad transition, essentially because we haven't picked up any spikes. So if this neuron is stop, stopping firing neuron number four, and neuron number six is like increasing its rate, well, we don't know exactly which point in this period that happened, okay? Because there's a period of no spikes. Um, I mean, I would actually think it's earlier because this very high rate, you know, you'd have a high likelihood of a spike if there is one. Um, but but it, you know, it, it um, basically maximizes the log likelihood of, of what the state sequence will be. Um, and and one, one of the kind of motivations for this, is, you know, for, for the work I've been doing has been these sort of data where you see, for example, there might be the same time, but in different trials where here on trial four, you've got this period around 1.5 seconds where state four is active. Well, on other trials, state three is active. So if you actually did what was, which has been typically done in systems neuroscience, which is to estimate the firing rate of a cell by averaging across many trials, its firing rate, you'll be getting these mixtures of all the states. So if you think of that um, cube that I showed with the two percepts, even though the stimulus is static, you might one trial initially see the right looking percept first, the next trial see the left looking one. Then if you average the neurons firing rates across trials, you'd see actually no indication of the whole phenomenon that's going on, this switching between percepts. So we, you know, we've been advocating this, these sort of analyses where you can look trial by trial. And you know, one of the necessities that's held that up is needing you know, many neurons to be recorded at the same time. So in our model of this, um, we kind of produced a reasonably structured network that just did many of the things that are seen in taste processing. Um, you can also think of part of the goal of taste processing is the decision. You know, do you, is this something you really want to eat or is this something you should spit out because it's disgusting? Um, and th this architecture is based a bit on the types of states we saw. And in this case, we just use inherent noise to drive the system through the states. And we could analyze the neural spike trains produced by the simulations in the same ways we analyze the data. And here again, I'm color coding the states. And when the solid line is at the top, it's indicating it's 100% you know, confident it's in that state. Um, and so 
here I just like picked out a couple of cells from each of those pools and did the same sort of analysis. Um, and, and you see, you know, even though they hit a mark of analysis is very confident, it's not always possible just by eye to see you know, a sharp state transition, but they're there and the model was designed to do it. Um, and this is just noise driving you through from one attractor state to the next. And it's in a reliable sequence. And because it's noise driven, if we do another trial, we find the durations of the states are very different, okay? So what this gives rise to is that um, even though on trial by trial, you see these pretty sharp transitions lasting a few tens of milliseconds as one state switches to the next state, when you actually average across trials and look at any neuron's average firing rate, you might see this you know, very slow ramping over, you know, over thousands of milliseconds. You know, more, this is like a second and a half of ramping. So we, we've actually, you know, th this caused us to like look at some other types of work, which I won't get into. And in particular, the idea of some decisions are meant to take, um, you know, on the order of a second or more. And if you look at single neurons, it can look like they're ramping gradually over time. But if you look trial by trial, it does seem more likely that they're actually jumping in a switch-like manner. So, so we actually you know, have done some more theory on not only what might be happening, but which is more optimal. Um, but I'm not going to go into that now. What, what I'm perhaps interested in is other more general cortical functions. And if we have networks that are less artific art artificially structured, and in particular, we're going to be looking at groups of neurons, but where the connections between them are randomized. Um, and I should say, I, I meant to say in the introduction, the first kind of two thirds of the talk are kind of showing simulation results and motivation. And the last part of the talk, I hope to get to some of the more you know, mathematical analysis of these sorts of networks. Um, and I'll also leave with some questions you know, we haven't quite got to the bottom of and ongoing work and so on. So here, um, each of these circles you know, it's kind of like one of those pools before where in reality, there'd be a lot of neurons in it, but we can treat rather than simulating every neuron individually, we can just think about, well, what is the average firing rate of that group as a function of time? So when we do that, we get a model which looks pretty much like this. So let, let me walk you through, through it. So there are different ways of doing these models, depending whether you think of the variable being the current coming into the cell. Um, which is what we're doing here. And then the firing rate is kind of a, in this case, an instantaneous function of that current input. Um, the current will go to zero in the lack of input. Here, this S stands for the self-connection strength. So there's some input coming from the group because cells in that group are giving excitatory input to other cells in the group. So we, we generally think of this S as being greater than zero. Um, then this corresponds to input from all the other groups. And the JIJ is just selected normally from a normal distribution. And the G, or oh, this, this might be an error. I think this should be a square root of N, not an N over here, because it's mean zero and it's the standard deviation that matters. Um, the G is basically telling us the strength of the input. Um, and the N is the number of um, total groups that we're going to simulate. And so you want to, you want to scale this with a square root of n so that the net input to, um, to any group is pretty much independent of n. And then the i app here would be if we're simulating any task, then the i app would actually correspond to input coming from other cells. These would be stimulus sensitive cells um, or cells that are processed the st stimulus and are giving input to this connection, this group of neurons. And so they, these will tend to be transient inputs, often rectangular pulses, and really what cell, which pools get input, and when they get the input is kind of really defining the, um, or simulating the actual specifics of the task that we're trying to um, simulate. One thing we're gonna look at, um, just because there are studies using different types of function here. So the firing rate of a neuron and because it's a rate, by definition, it can't go negative. So we use this function, the logistic function, and essentially because neurons have a maximum rate and they can't be less than zero. So anything which is kind of S-shaped worked. 
Here we use the logistic function. And when, when you have this type of um, firing rate curve, you can get um, by stability um, just within a single unit. So if we kind of neglect these terms, so there's no inputs coming to the pool, and we just look at their self connections defined by this left part of the equation, then you can see the fixed points are when the current is equal to the S times the firing rate, okay? So if we put the firing rate is the current divided by S, we get these um, straight lines. And in purple, what I've shown is the actual firing rate curve as a function of the input. Where these lines cross are the fixed points. And you can see if you have large enough feedback, this is this yellow dashed line, then you can get by stability. And essentially what is happening here is that you've eventually got enough feedback that even though the firing rate would go to zero um, because you, you um, decay exponentially without feedback, the feedback can be high enough that you sustain this high level of firing rate. So you, you can have a region of two fixed points. Um, you know, in this system, there's another bifurcation where with you know, even much, much higher input, you lose the, um, you know, the, the low firing rate state down here becomes unstable. And you would eventually go, you know, if, if the gradient here were low enough, you would only hit at a way, sorry, I don't, at a way high firing rate, but we're, we're not looking at those regimes. So <clears throat> what, what I'm gonna show now is first some simulations where we have the S just high enough so that you can get bi stability within the groups. Okay, so then, um, and then we'll see it's some of the behavior. So, so one type of behavior that um, you know, we first found, found these sorts of networks can do is if you have um, inputs that are basically constant, and what I'm actually gonna be doing is giving a fixed kind of rectangular function input as a pulse, and this is gonna be equal input to every neuron in the network or every pool of neurons in the network, okay? And the question is, you know, can the network tell you how many such pulses there were? Um, now, there's been, ge you know, general previous models of, you know, and this is basically what we, you know, what counting is. And some animals, you know, different animals can count to different extents, but getting, you know, telling the difference between two and one is pretty common. Certainly three, four is possible and, and maybe higher. Um, there, there's one compound, though, if you use what are the standard models for counting is that they use integrators, you know, which are inherently one dimensional. So if you have inputs, then you just do the mathematical integration and you know, the more inputs you have each time you go up by one. But you get, of course, this confound that if the inputs took twice as long, then each time you get one input, you might get up to two, they would double the time. Or if the inputs would double the amplitude, each time you get an input, you get to two, okay? So the, this kind of suggests that an integrator, you know, is, is certainly not sufficient. And, you know, what some of those other models would say is that, well, there must be some sort of pre-processing or front ends to ensure that when you are counting, you know, whatever is integrating and actually doing the counting of the pulses, make sure those input pulses are all identical. Um, but what we find is in this network, and first we find that it, can count in the sense that it will give a different state. Um, so I should say this. So, so you have, you know, you have the general issue that when you have many inputs that have durations and amplitudes that can differ, you know, number is only one factor. And if you're getting a sim single variable output, then you've confounded these, these other aspects of it. And um, so you want to dissociate these different inputs. And that's the first thing that these networks can do. But one thing that we have to do in these networks. Um, because if you think if we're just giving identical inputs successively to the network, nearly all networks will do pretty much the same thing. Um, that if you're activating some cells, you give that identical input, you're activating the same cells, they'll stay active. But a key ingredient here is something called synaptic depression. And I'll, I'll kind of show what that is, but it's kind of like a resources issue that it, at the synaptic connections, that when you produce a current in the postsynaptic cell. And um, so when one presynaptic cell spikes, it produces that current I kind of showed schematically before. Next time it produces a spike, there's actually a little less neurotransmitter around and there are fewer vesicles remaining basically. 
so the spike might be lower and then lower. And you end up reaching some sort of steady state of spike heights, which really is dependent on how quickly this neurotransmitter can be recycled and refueled or how quickly vesicles can be docked back to the synapse because you know, you've got to have a return of the resources for the next spike. And then clearly what you see here is that the higher the firing rate, the lower the steady state, be just because there's less time between spikes for um, vesicles to dock, neurotransmitters to be recycled and so on. So there are kind of the equations then that you know, describe this. And, and I should say, the, the, this is adapted from some more talks from more biology audiences, but I think being mathematicians, you'd like to see the equations. So this was the initial synaptic transmission saying you know, what, what the spikes of one cell are doing to the postsynaptic cell. But we incorporate this factor, okay? With this D is a depression variable and it depends on J, which is the presynaptic cell here. And the key is that this variable and this small plus means right after the spike is reduced from where it is just before the spike. And this P is really, it could be an F for the fraction of the probability that vesicles are released. Um, so if you release 90% of the vesicles in one spike, then immediately after that spike, your efficacy, the strength of the synapse is you know, down to 10% because you've lost 90% of the neurotransmitter. Then in between spikes, it's gonna recover um, and because this is just a factor which goes from one when there's no depression, zero means there's nothing left to release any neurotransmitter. Um, this factor will return to one in between spikes with some time constant, which is in the hundreds of milliseconds range. Okay. I should say as well, we can simulate this process. This is when we do deal with spikes. In the firing rate model, you just, again, you multiply the input by D, but in, in this case, because we're not dealing with the spikes, the depression factor is decreasing by something proportional to the firing rate and the probability of release. So this becomes the equation. And if you solve this just to find, well, suppose the firing rate were fixed, what is the steady state value of the depression variable? Clearly it's going down with firing rate here. So as the firing rate goes up, then the depression variable goes down. Um, what this is gonna do for this system is it's basically gonna mean that once you've had some cells that are very active in a state, the next stimulus comes on. And, and it really is, I kind of think of it like a relay race. If, um, you know, the, if someone's running at 400 meters, but someone else is you know, in a relay and they've just been resting after the first leg, well, when they're given the baton, they're going to have a lot more energy, you know, a lot more resources and maybe able to go faster, even if the first, um, the run that's still going was ahead on the first leg. So what this is allowing is basically those neurons that were inactive when you get the second stimulus, they're gonna have this very big response um, compared to you know, what might be a very small response from the highly active neurons. And that might allow them to take over. And so, so we put this into the network and what I'm gonna show you is you know, in response to consecutive constant inputs, so we've repeated uniformly. And on the y-axis are these different pools. So this is a network, I just did a hundred of them. And you see these very different states. So we've got groups of cells that are active at any one time, um, but it just shifts. The whole activity is shifting from pulse to pulse. And Being one of the things we can do is we can add a bit of noise um, and just say after four pulses, what is the average activity? And call that the representation for pulse four. Look at the activity after five pulses, say that's the representation for pulse, pulse five and so on. Then we can do a whole bunch of single trials and say, can it be classified as four? Can it be classified as five? And we look at a, when we do that classification, we see, you know, in this particular example, you know, it basically could exactly distinguish the network activity up to nine pulses. Then the 10th one, you know, th this is kind of interesting an indication of what's happening. It doesn't know if it's seven and 10. And what that's telling you is that after you've done the ninth pulse, whatever state it's in, you provide another pulse. And it basically pretty much, it looks just like the activity of seven pulses. So it can't really distinguish 10 and seven, but it's counted up to nine, fine. Um, I saw there was a raised hand, I think. Jonathan. That's me. Can Hi. you hear me? I can Hi. hear you, yeah. I can't see. Yeah, so uh, just a question about the setup of this experiment. So do you, the, the stimulus is presented to all of the cells at the same time? Yes, yeah, equally to all 100. So some of them just happen to have a little more excitatory input from other cells, 
Right. And there's got to be a whole lot of network theory here yeah, that there are subsets of cells who are more connected to each other and mm -hmm. therefore their net excitation as they start firing is just a little bit higher than any other subset and they take off. But then when you give there, the next They are the pulse, same cells, right? Sorry? Only the connections are distinct. They are the same cells, only connections are random. Yeah, right? the only heterogeneity is these cross connections, even the self connections identical in this. Okay. So, and, so uh, okay. And so what you're trying to decode in the end is the after after 10 stimuli or I mean is it so is it so what I'm trying to decode is each of these states and really just saying is it distinct from any of the other states. So you can see by eye that it's pretty clear in some cases. Um and, and I'll show you some of the individual cells in a minute. But, but the, the point is that the activity, you know, after five inputs is very different from four and three and two and one. But the activity after 10 inputs is not that different from the activity after seven here. So you can't really distinguish 10 from seven. So it gives you an idea of the information capacity, I guess, just from this yeah, very was... simple input. So I guess my question is, is this, because I, I understand this kind of convergence to kind of a coding for a large number of stimulus that would be different from a small one. But is the, the particular pattern of activity that we see, for instance, from stimulus one to stimulus four, is that due to noise initial condition or is it kind of something that if you redo the simulation, another time you would get something similar? So, so this is what I'm showing here. Um, you know, th there's a small amount of noise. So this is, this is very noise dependent. If you put too much noise in, it messes up. Um, and, th and there's actually some interest in, when you do this with spiking neurons, things are a little bit better because in these firing rate models, when you add noise, you're kind of giving noise equally to every group of cells. But in reality, because the, the dominant noise is coming from presynaptic inputs, it's almost the group of cells that is getting the most input is also getting the most noise. So, so things are better. But, but in, in this network with firing rate models, this is the result with um, low noise, where we run 10 trials, look at the average activity and treat those as target patterns. Then we use another number of 10 test trials. So, and then it shows that it reproduces them really well. And so what is what remains is that you take the same heterogeneity in the connectivity network. Right? Yes, yeah, network? it's always the same circuit. It's gotta be the same circuit. Okay and different noise. All right, so the pattern you see is due to the connection. Exactly, yeah. Itself. If you change the connection, you would change this pattern to not be neuron 10, 20, 30, and 50. It would be over neurons, but they exactly. would be fixed yeah. given. Okay, I understand. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, and, and I should say one of the things we're interested in and have never got to any solid results, if you do different instantiations of the network here, yeah, you use the same... Um, Gauss, you know, the same Gaussian random number generated the same with the same variance, same mean and so on for connection strengths, you're going to get a different network. Some behave better than others. Um, you know, some, some just can have longer sequences, some shorter ones. And later, like the number of different distinct attractor states is different. Um, we'd like to be able to tell just by looking at the connectivity, which networks will perform well and which ones can't. And it's very hard to find anything which correlates more than a few percent with any of that. You know, so our predictivity, just by looking at the connectivity matrix as to how well this particular example will perform, is pretty poor. And, and it's kind of interesting because you know that things aren't purely random. What you might like is that there'll be some, um, some feedback or some ways of training a network so that it does really well. And if we know which sort of networks do well, we'd be able to know what sort of training rules, you know, what correlations within the connections help. But, but we, we haven't got, we haven't got anything. There's no smoking gun, as they say. In that. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Thank you. Okay. And just to set, show here that, you know, with different amplitude and different durations of stimuli, um, that the network doesn't end up in the same state. And this is because part of during the stimulus, so, so if we went from a 100 to a 200 millisecond stimulus, um, that just by extending the stimulus, we're actually changing which neurons are gonna be active. And, and this is because there's a lot of feedback loops and, and we'll get into why that is later. 
and also changing the amplitude of the stimulus. Um, and we can show this here. So, so now we, you know, we, we're doing these different sets of stimulations, just giving four pulses at a time. Um, and really checking, you know, is our two pulses of 200 milliseconds very different from one pulse of 400, four pulses of 100 milliseconds and so on. And what we find is there are some cells that, or some pools that look, you know, that look more like integrators. So this group, you know, if you give it two 100 millisecond pulses of amplitude one, it switches on. Um, you know, so, so this little peak is during the stimulus, but then it's kind of stable post-stimulus. And it's also on though, if you double the duration and just give one pulse or double the amplitude and just give one pulse, okay? There are others that just seem to correspond to a particular number. Like in this case, it's only firing after the first pulse. And there are others which are kind of, and, the, and the, these are the sorts of cells which are also common in the brain. You know, they're modules. So this one is only firing at three pulses of the double amplitude, but not three pulses of the double duration and not three pulses of the standard amplitude. So you get these, um, you know, these would be called mixed selectivity cells. So, the, so you know, what, what the readout is, though, is that you, know, you could take any combination of these and then produce a readout that tells you how many pulses there are. Um, and this is just showing that you, know, you do get very different sets of activity across the network. And this was just with 50 units. Um, there are some things you might notice that because there's a lot of you know, inhibition in the network, the more cells that are on, the lower the average firing rate because there's more net inhibition. Um, but again, you know, all these different sequences with different amplitudes and different durations give very distinct activity states in the network. Okay, so so part of our idea, you know, so far we haven't looked at you know reading this out, but just showing the idea is that um, a lot of things that we learn, the information from any sort of trial that you give an animal, you know, you give a set of different stimuli, immediately afterwards. The, it has a distinct network state and it knows what the stimuli are, are. The real aspect of the training is to get it to know what to do with that. You know, you're basically doing some sort of giving rewards. So, so just, or with humans, when you're teaching us things, you know, to know what words to associate with that type of stimuli, how to label it and so on. The, in many ways, you know, that this is where we're coming from, that that could be the more difficult part, that you can often produce a distinct network activity, but given that activity, what should it represent? What, what behavior should correlate with that? So I'm gonna show you a few more tasks and I, I do wanna, okay, I realize time is, time is moving. Um, may, maybe I'll just show the first two here. So the, these, are, these are tasks. The first task um, that I'm gonna show is one where um, this group by um, Chris Harvey's group, they were looking at mice running down, they, they call this a maze, you know, it's just got a T-junction really. And depending, um, it would get flashes of light on the left or the right. And depending which side there are more flashes would indicate should it take a left turn or a right turn. So this is kind of like one step um, following what we just did because it's got counting, but now it's kind of a comparison. So there'll be two different types of inputs. So in this case, we just randomly choose one fraction of cells we get input we call left input. We randomly choose another fraction of cells. We give them a pulse, we call that right input. And then we want to know, can the network you know, discriminate? Did it get more left pulses versus right pulses? Um, so we use the same sort of network as before, um, just randomly connected. But the key aspect we're gonna add now is we're gonna do some training. So there's gonna be you know, an output which is gonna to correspond to the motor program to move left or to move right. And because you can only move left or right, there's inhibition between these motor outputs. So one, you know, this is gonna be winner take all one or the other. And then we introduce basically it's a reinforcement learning type of rule. And what this does is that neurons that are active at the same time as say, if you chose left, these neurons would be active and you get a reward. And this is the training aspect they're given juice then and it's really a reward prediction error so if they're not sure they're going to get reward they got reward they get a pulse of dopamine that will increase the strength of those connections so that next time suppose you know suppose these two you know, I, I don't know peach looking pools were active you went left and it was correct 
then next time those two groups are active, you're more likely to go left because you strengthen the connection. And this is kind of the way that you know, reinforcement learning works in AI. And you can produce a readout so that eventually you're going to read out um, the activity from the network and produce a left right response. And this will always work if you get the collection. Um, you know, here I'm showing four, five, six, seven, eight, but 10. You know, this, the activity of these would be some point in a 10 dimensional space. Um, what, what you're essentially doing is each time you want to take a left turn, you'll get a particular point in 10 dimensional space at the end of the sequence. And if you can put a plane, a hyperplane between one set of 10, 10 dimensional points um, for the left turn versus the points for the right turn, then you can always produce some sort of learning rule that would weight these connections so that you're more likely to go left for um, the correct left turns and right for the correct right turns. So when we do that, um, you know, th this kind of shows, first of all, that with the 64 possible sequences, we do actually get distinct activity states. There are 64 because they gave six pulses and each one could be left or right. So that's two to the power of six. And then that with this learning rule, um, and this was, I think with a fair amount of noise, you could actually produce something that basically looks like the animal's behavior. Um, the thing that's somewhat interesting here, which isn't guaranteed a priori, um, of course, when there are three left cues, it's 50-50, there's no correct choice. But if you compare two left cues to four right cues, you know, that th those points in high dimensional space, um, a priori shouldn't be any harder to, to distinguish than you know, when you've done zero left cues and only right cues. But it does turn out that you do get, you know, the closer the difference in the number of clues, cues so when you're going two versus four or four versus two is actually a bit harder to distinguish than zero versus six. Um, so, and, and this, is, this is kind of what is seen in the, the mouse. If you just gave six flashes on one side, it's much easier to, for it to decide to go to that side than if you've done two versus four. There are some other interesting factors related to this. Um, what we can do is we can, what we're looking at is if you can generalize, you know, because here the question is, is, is the network really counting? You know, in fact, it's not. We've just categorized different states in a way. So, so you can ask, well, if you train them on some of the examples and then test on other ones. So if we train when it's two versus four, which are the harder examples, and then test on the easier ones. So you, if you train the network on the two versus four, you get 100% in those cases. Um, you always find you also get 100% performance on the zero versus six. Um, in some way, you could say that if just the latest queue kick the network into a particular state, then you you know, th then this would kind of work because you, when there's um, zero versus six, if you listen to the first queue or the last queue, it's always telling you where to go. Um, one versus five is not quite so good. Um, and here you see performance on the trained versus not trained. You know, th there's a pretty good generalization. You're getting 90% performance on patterns of activity that you never train the performance on. It doesn't work so well when we do the other way. If we train on the easy examples, zero to six or one versus five, and then see how well that generalizes to two versus four. You know, it does okay, and um, it's better than chance, but the level here is pretty much what you get if you just listen to the first stimulus or just listen to the last one. And, and one thing that's interesting is, you know, when the mice do this task, maybe they are doing shortcuts. They're just saying, well, if the last cue or the first cue is in a particular direction, then I'm going to go that direction. You know, it's not to me. It's not a hundred percent clear they are generalizing, um, and really in a manner that suggests they're counting. They might be doing something more similar to our network, and then, you know, training on patterns and just saying, is this the closest pattern? Okay. I think what I'll do in the interest of time is sorry, I shouldn't have done that. is skip some of these other tasks. Well, one thing that I'm showing, I, I decided as well, we, we could have groups of different stimuli and see if the final state depends on the whole set of stimuli or just the first one or just the last one. And you get some effects that are very similar to recall of sequences where the final state, especially if we go to this one and we have some data, the final state, you know, that there's activity from the initial stimulus, which kind of can last so that the final state has some similarity to the first stimulus more than others. 
um, but probably most of the last stimulus if it's a long sequence. Um, and and what I should just point what I just did in these two is I just switched the two middle ones, D and E, and it gave a very dis different you know, sequence following that switch. So you can get information about a whole pattern of sequences um, that has a lot of the features of word recall. Um, and just to show essentially what we have here, if we have a four word list and we ask, what does the final pattern most look like compared to each input on its own? And the, these inputs again were just random, hitting random cells out of a group of 50. And you know, as, as you know, you know there, there's an astronomical number of combinations of that you can choose. So, so the repertoire is pretty huge, but you can ask, does a final state, which word in the list does it look, most look like if you're trying to do recall? For short lists, the final state, you know, even though you give them four stimuli, it looks most often like the first stimulus. But for longer lists, it looks most often like the last stimulus. So you get this shift, where which happens with all human and recall, that if you give short lists, we often begin our recall with the first one. If you give long longer lists, you often begin your recall with the later ones. So this is just by seeing which patterns are closest. Okay, I'm going to jump through this other task because I don't have time. Because um, what I particularly wanted to just spend a little bit of time on at the end was a bit of a math of analyzing these collections of units. And one of the questions is um, that we saw from these equations is we saw, we've seen in a lot of our simulations that even when we have low self-feedback so that this S is not big enough to make a single unit by stable, we would see a lot of multi-stable states, okay? So what, what we're doing here is comparing with some work by others. Um, this is um, Heim Sombolinsky and Larry Abbott and Merov Stern, who did, you know, who's the first author on the paper, they analyzed these networks where the firing rate curve was a hyperbolic tangent function, and also looking in the large n limit. And what, what we were interested in is if some of the behavior analysis that differed was whether it's because we had finite size effects, even when the n is 100, you know, that's still a long way from infinite, or because we're using a different firing rate curve. You know, and I should say, you know, having a hyperbolic tangent as a firing rate curve on a first blush is a little strange because it's saying firing rates are negative, but you could kind of work it out that if, if you have inhibitory and excitatory cells in a pool, and if you say the excitatory cells are firing much more than the inhibitory cells, you have positive rate. If the inhibitory cells are firing much more than the excitatory cells, you have negative rate. And I mean, I'm not sure that ever occurs, but if that did, you know, th but that's one way you could say that this could represent a group of cells. And, but then it's intriguing because it's often considered that the, the net behavior is pretty much the same. Um, and I should say what, what we've done in our work is we've done a comparison. And, and I should say, we also use this heaviside function because it's easier from analysis that I hope to get to in a minute. So what, we'd, what we've done is we've set up our firing rate curves and I think you can just see, so this red dashed line is when the feedback is one. And this is where you have a bifurcation point. So in the hyperbolic tangent model is you go from, in all these cases, when there's low feedback, you just have one fixed point where the firing rate is zero or near zero. Then you go to multi by stability at high feedback. This one I think is a pitch fork um, bifurcation. In the other two cases is saddle node. Um, but we've basically chosen our parameters so that when the feedback is one, this red dashed line is right at the bifurcation point. And what that means is that when S is greater than one, the single unit is bistable. Then if you think of a collection of 50 new units, for example, if each unit is bistable and you have 50 of them, if there are no cross connections, you actually have two to the power of 50 different activity states for the network, which is, which is huge. It's kind of boring when there's no cross connections, um, you know, the interactions give rise to all the sorts of interesting behaviors I showed before. Um, now, this is a result from their paper. And if I just run through this, so, so the origin is where there's no feedback either between units or within a unit. If we go up the y-axis, when we get to one, we get a bifurcation where now each unit is independently bistable. And so now you have multi-stability because we have this two to the power of n distinct states. As we go along the x-axis, there's a point where now there's, you know, the self-connection is 
zero or mean zero, and the cross connections dominate, and you get a transition to chaos, which Heinz Sombolinsky showed back in the early 90s or late 80s. Um, now, what, what is you know, great about this is they've actually mapped out the whole phase diagram. But what, one key aspect you see is you don't get multi-stability anywhere um, below S equals one. In fact, this transition line from chaos to multi-stability has a positive gradient so that the greater the cross connections, you have to make the self connections even stronger. And one thing that's kind of very interesting is this fascinating property of transient chaos, that in these regions with multi-stability, when you have high cross connections, you get essentially chaotic activity um, for a period of time until you finally settle into a, a fixed point. And so here you've got multiple fixed points, um, but which one you end up in, um, you know, I should say here that you know would depend very much on the initial conditions. Alternatively, you can think when we when I was showing these um, patterns of activity with a constant stimulus, it's kind of we were putting with our constant stimulus the network into this sort of state, and depending how long you left it, we kind of froze it into a chaotic state afterwards. So you can think of then with these stimuli, if you kind of shut things down at different points, you'll end up in a different network state. So that, so in some sense you've got a timing, you, you could really read out the time from the onset of the simulation here by which um, units are active or so on. But what we found in our simulations were uh, multi-stability way below this line. So first we're looking to see, well, was this finite size effect? And we do see some interesting phenomena. You know, here at n equals 20, you can be way below the line. So these red lines are their phase boundaries. Um, where you have above 50%. Um, so here, because we're what we're doing are simulations, the numbers are saying what percent of networks are multi-stable. And we get way above 50% being multi-stable. Um, you know, at n equals 20. Whereas when you get up to about n equals 100, you see everywhere below the line, fewer than 50% are multi-stable. Some things that aren't clear is that it might be a simulation time that you know when you have transient chaos you might have to simulate a long, long time to see if you get stability or not. And, but these, you know, th these didn't reach stability in a long time. Um, so you know, finite size effects are, are at least important when n equals 20. Um, but it doesn't, but when we went to the logistic function, we find you know, w here, you know, even at n equals 100, you know, some cases are almost 100% of the networks, even when we're below s equals one. Um, so what we what we really want to do is basically, you know, one thing is to get the infinite then n limit for these networks, <clears throat> and and therefore to you know really assess and be concrete. When we're seeing large fractions of networks that are multi-stable here, is it a finite size effect, or is it just because the logistic function in the infinite limit? limit um, is actually multi-stable at below this level of feedback, cell feedback. Um, so we, one way we proceeded with, was with some analysis of the binary network. And if we simulated that, we see even a larger region of bistability. And what I should say then is, you know, analyzing the binary network, what we could do is we could basically say, if we have a n units total, we could ask, for a particular subset of K units, what is the probability that with K units being active, N minus K, the remaining ones being inactive, what is the probability that that will be a stable state? And essentially what you need is that um, when we have S below one, like this blue dashed line, you need to get enough current from all the active units to push it this way. So we want like the, this blue dashed curve to be pushed to the right, enough for the active units so that it crosses there. And whereas for the inactive units, they can't be getting so much input that this blue dashed line is pushed right past one so that they become on. So we can basically, if we just use that and just assume um, random Gaussian connections, then we know what the total inputs are. We basically get these error functions. And then you know, all K units that we are saying are on should be on so that you get that probability to the power of K to the power of N minus K for the ones not getting enough to be switched on that should be off. And you know that's the probability for a particular subset. So we can then you know 
work this out for different values of n and k. But what one of the issues I'm kind of a little bit stuck on is I can, although this is exact for a particular subset of k units being on out of the n in the network, what we're interested on is, in is there any possible subset of k. So we can calculate that if there are no correlations in these probabilities for different values of k and different subsets of k. And we can, but when we make this approximation, what we're actually doing is we're actually overestimating the probability of multi-stability. Because if for a particular subset of k units being on, then when we pick another subset of k units, there's gonna be some intersection, okay? And the easiest one is when you just switch one of those units, you've got another subset of k. Um, however, if the first subset were not on, it's much more likely than chance that the net other subset is not on if many of those connections are the same, if you, if you understand what I mean. So, so this is where I'm getting a little kind of stuck in doing this calculation. And, and if anyone has ideas or different, you know, math textbooks I should look into to help proceed, that, that would be great. Because what happens when we do this, um, you know, th these are our simulations. And I should say the simulations are providing a lower bound because it may be we just didn't simulate long enough to find the fixed points. Or certainly once we get above n equals 20, with n equals 20, we can try in every initial condition. By n is, is 100, there are two to the 100, which is, you know, you can never simulate that many initial conditions. It may be we've just not hit the initial conditions that land in a different stable state. So these are providing an upper bound. If we, you know, if we find multi-stability, we are sure it exists, but when we don't find it, maybe it does exist. These are providing a lower bound. Um, you know, they, they look similar, so we kind of know we're on the right track. But then if we look, you know, if we pick some of these values around here near the boundary, and we see as a function of n, you know, so here we're looking as the network size increases. So, um, and this is partly to see if it is a finite size. So the symbols are the simulations, and we do see a peak in the simulations. But again, with these large networks, we just don't know, is it we just didn't try, you know, certainly by n equals a thousand, is very possible that there's multi-stability. We just never found it in that huge dimensional space. Um, and I, as you see, what happens is our limits aren't great because here, you know, between n equals 100 and n equals 1000, our lower limit on the probability or the fraction of multi-stable networks is zero, whereas our analysis giving the upper limit is one. And so we're no better than if we did nothing, saying it's between zero and one. So, you know, that, that this is what we're trying to work, work on a little bit more now. And, um, you know, you can run simulations longer, see if any of these points start rising by finding more multi-stable networks or trying more initial conditions. Ideally, I'd like to find, figure out how to put some corrections into the analysis to see if this one comes down. Um, so I think this is where I'll leave you and thank you for all your attention. These are the people who've been involved in all the work. Um, you might recognize some of them, Ben and Jordan are currently in the lab. Ben and Siwi were postdocs who left the lab in recent years. So thank you for the attention and I'll, I'll stop, stop sharing. Well, thank you very much for such a nice talk. Um, so if you have any question, please raise your hand and um, we can unmute you. Oh. Hi, Tom, Thomas. Hi, thanks, Paul. I just wanted to ask again, so this calculation that you did for the lower bound, could you just explain again what's behind this, uh, this analytic? Oh, the analytic calculation. Yeah. Right. Okay. Let me go through it a little more. Slowly. I mean, I'm also curious on the computational side, how do you define a stable state? I mean, for example, how do you know it's not something that's metastable in your computations? So, so generally you can see there's like an exponential decay over time. Um, you know, if you look at the deviation, the change from one time step to the next, um, so in these simulations, I should say th this is without noise. So if you had noise, you know, you can't really do these analysis because everything is eventually going to be metal sta stable. It's just the time scale that, that becomes important. Um, th there are two things that are tricky. One of the things is, that's tricky is we might get limit cycles in some of these networks. And in fact, we do. So you might think some of these scalar, and we're, we're really trying to look at discrete fixed points. Um, 
but the the nature of these systems when units are all on um is very unlikely that you know there's usually a threshold or maybe if i go back i don't see your slide oh, right now oh sorry <laughs> I have to um, go back to screen sharing. Oh, this is way slow. So go to the Zoom, share screen. Okay, can't quite do this. Um, so, so with with the sigmoid, it's similar. But if you've got activity you know, around here, it's very unlikely you're going to then shift all the way past that point. So if you know all the units have got sufficiently high activity. You know, that they're they're sufficiently far from the unstable fixed point then you're pretty sure now that is you know a stable fixed point um i mean so so that there, there is a time scale and it's generally if you if you just see that the activity is converging over a certain time scale and it's all converging to a high activity state or a low activity state then you're pretty sure if activity were converging gradually to this unstable fixed point in the middle then you would want to wait just in case that unit crossed and then it could give a big change. So, so that in the simulations, we're pretty confident. Now in the analysis with the binary network, um, you, you know that, that when you're at this point, you're stable and when you're at this point, you're stable. Um, and, and essentially, because, because of the step function here, you know that if your input is less than one, your activity will be zero. So, so long as there's nothing kicking your input above one, you're going to stay at zero activity. And the same here, so long as your net input is greater than, in this case, one minus s, that when you're active, you're going to stay active. So if your input is great from other units is greater than one minus s, you're going to stay active. If you're inactive and your input is less than one, you're going to stay inactive. So that, that's kind of how these, these fixed points works in that system. So then you can just say, well, when there are k units that are active and each unit has a connection to you drawn randomly from the, the Gaussian, you then know what your total input would be. You know, is also drawn from a Gaussian um, with a standard deviation you know, proportional to the square root of n over g, which is kind of this n over g comes in here, okay? And this k minus one is because there are k minus one active units. So, so this, this basically tells you um, how likely one unit is to get net input of one minus s from all these k minus one other active units, each with coming from a standard deviation with j over square root of n. Um, and then you have to take that to the power of k because this has got to be true for every subunit in the every unit in the set of active units you want to be k of k active units. So that so this is for the k active units to be on. They've got to be get, getting input greater than one minus s from all the other on ones, whereas the off ones have to be getting unit that's less than one from the k on ones. And there's n minus k off ones. So this is you know so th this I'm is kind of exact to say a particular subset of k units um, being on is stable. And th this becomes astronomically small, but as n gets large, but there are astronomically large numbers of such subsets. You know, so this is where then you've got this C, this combinatorics CKN of, um, um, of the number of combinations. So, you, you're going to be able to actually get k units being on um, in some stable combination, so long as not all of them are unstable. So the probability of you know, any one combination being unstable is this 1 minus p0. For all of them to be unstable is that 1 minus p0 raised to the power of that combination, which is how many combinations there are. And this I know is an approximation because of the correlations that if one set of k is unstable, um, one particular set, set of k, then it's more likely another overlapping set is unstable. Um, and that's why it's a lower bound? And uh, Well, so it's a lower bound on the instability because to be multi-stable, you only need one combination to be multi-stable. Whereas to be, you know, to have no multi-stability, you need everyone to be unstable. 
but if one is unstable, it's more likely another one is unstable. Just like if one is stable, it's more likely another one is stable. <laughs> so, so it, it kind of means that we're not that likely to find just one stable state. We might actually quite find quite a few, but we're calling it a multi-stable system as long as there's more than one. You know, other than the z the zero state is always stable in this. So it's you know non-zero states. So it's it's actually an upper bound on these curves when we're looking at what is the probability a network is multi-stable. Um, because I see. So you have you have the, your number of fixed points, but then only some fraction of them is actually stable. Yes, yes. So the number of fixed points is always going to be huge, but they're generally going to be unstable. And that there's a kind of I mean, I mean that it's not a strict rule, but the higher, you know, when you go to really high dimensions, if you think that every, you know, the number of eigenvalues is proportional to the number of dimensions at any fixed point, but you need all of them to be, you know, so, so if eigenvalues were randomly positive or negative, yeah, the probability of any one fixed point being stable would be two to the n, you know, if it was just 50 50, whether it's positive or negative, then, you know, it becomes, most most fixed points will become saddle points because some eigenvalues are going to be negative, some are going to be positive in general. So you you, you get tons of fixed points, but it's hard to get stability, or it can be. Let me stop the share. All right, do we have any other questions for Paul? I have, a, I have kind of an open question. I think it I mean, thanks for Paul. It was really, really interesting. Yeah. Sorry for coming a little late. I mean, I had students at my office hours very early, I mean, very late and early in the semester, which is very strange. I don't know why, mm -hmm. <laughs> but that pushed me a little. So I had a question. So about the decoding and the fact that you're able to, to match the patterns and about whether you have any idea i know it's a very broad question but whether you have any idea of kind of rules like plasticity rules or some kind of physiological rules that may allow to decode i mean if oh. that's something you want to do or and how does the decoding depends on the algorithm that you used because it was pretty impressive that you got a hundred percent for okay that many patterns and yeah so so a lot of this is noise dependent um, and as you add more and more noise, you know, if you're not reliably in the same state, but when you are in the same state, um, if you have high enough dimensional space, you know, compared to the number of patterns you need to decode, you're always going to be able to find a hyperplane that goes through them. And, and so the plasticity rule, we, we've used it in a bunch of papers and there, there's, you know, there, there's some evidence, you know, it's actually the striatal plasticity where they see some of this evidence that the key thing you need is you want Hebbian plasticity, which is when the presynaptic unit is firing and the postsynaptic firing unit is firing. You want that to strengthen when you get reward or unexpected reward. And that's gonna basically, if one is kind of your sensory coding and the other is your output, it's gonna make you more likely to produce that output when you have that sensory coding. So this three factor rule, presynaptic firing, postsynaptic firing plus reward, should give you strengthening. And then you've got to break the symmetry so that if you no, get no reward, you know, you either don't strengthen or you depress, or there'll be some other circumstances where you where you depress. If you've got pre before, you know, presynaptic cell firing, the postsynaptic cell is not firing and you get reward, maybe you want to strengthen that so you don't do that. So that there are there are different combinations, but but really then there are eight, you know, because it's a three factor rule, there are eight terms, you know, high rate, low rate, high rate, low rate reward, no reward. And you definitely want all three being positive to give you a strengthening and somewhere else in that set of eight to get weaker. Um, and you get slightly different behavior depending on this three factor rule, which three factors you use to give weakening and, and how you balance out the strengthening and weakening. Um, okay. So, so I know um, Xiao Jing Wang with Ali Soltani, they did this nice, I teach this in my course called the weather patterning task. Where they actually, you know, you can get probabilistic results, or where there are actually multiple cues. It's called the weather weather forecast task because the idea is there are different indicators, and you want to know should you bring an umbrella or should you bring your sunglasses or something. Like that. And so you have a binary response, but there are different factors, and some are much more predictive than others. And they show that these sorts of rules can actually allow you pretty well to 
you know, match the log odds and the synaptic strengths. And then you, you're kind of adding the log odds to decide your function or whether you should do one choice or the other. So it's, and of course, multiplying probabilities gives you the best choice of the answers. So. Right which is adding the log odds. So, so there, there are some nice work on that. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I, I think the machine learning literature has had these rules of reinforcement learning for decades. Yeah. And, and I think this is one case where it's come into neuroscience and neuroscience have been looking more and more for it, but it's, it's not being as solid as we'd li I'd, I'd like it to be. <laughs> no, that's true. And sometimes they are not physiologically plausible or we don't know how to do how yeah. to match what machine learning does. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm. Okay. Yeah, that's all I have. Oh, th thank you. All. Thank you very much, Paul. That was thank really you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for your attention, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Thank you.